James Norman. I'm the president and CEO of Action for a Better Community, and I've been um, in that role since 1992. And over the years, um, we got involved in uh, issues of structural equality uh, in a heavy way beginning uh, in 2008. Uh, and uh, that led to the creation of uh, two organizations. Uh, one was RISE, the Rochester Initiative for Structural Equality, uh, and ultimately that evolved into what we know now today as FREE, which is Face and Race, Embrace and Equity. Um, ABC, which is the you know, organization I work for, mm -hmm. uh, started in 1964. Uh, and it was uh, the organizational response to the uh, riots that occurred in Rochester in the summer of 1964. Um, you know, so at the time, um, the community uh, leaders, the uh, community leaders, uh, all got together trying to figure out what should we do now. Um, now that we can't uh, uh, ignore these some of these issues anymore, uh, and they decided that there was no existing organization at the time that was um, uh, perhaps able to or preferred to do the work that needed to be done and uh, they decided to create a new organization uh, and that's how ABC uh, came to be. Uh, and so they were planning, uh, the way the name came about was they were at a meeting at Child Care Center on South Avenue. Mm -hmm. They were thinking, thinking, they saw these children's blocks on the floor at ABC, they said, okay, well, what we can make, what can we make out of ABC? Um, and I came action for a better community. That's, that's what we've been ever since. That's awesome. So, what is your role in free? And um, and it sounds like ABC is definitely informed your interest in the summit. And for sure, yeah, for sure. Well, um, how I got to free uh, a little bit more about that yeah. is that um, uh, I am um, as a community action uh, leader a part of a national association called the Community Action Partnership. And um, I was on the board of that organization from 2002 to 2008. And uh, during the course of uh, being on the board, um, I helped uh, develop a, a conference that was held in Bethesda, Maryland in 2007. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, at that conference, I went to a uh, presentation on structural racism. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was very uh, eye-opening. Uh, and it brought together a connection between inequality and racism and poverty in a way that never had been uh, brought together for me before. And because of that uh, inspiration, um, you know, I was able to collaborate with some people to go to the Ford Foundation to get a small grant to start a national pilot project uh, in seven cities around the United States. Uh, because I was involved in planning, um, I ensured that Rochester was one of those cities. Um, and so what we did is we developed this initiative called the Rochester Institute of Structural Equality, RISE. Mm -hmm. uh, and the whole purpose for RISE is, is really the same as the purpose for free. Uh, that is to you know, you know, raise the issues of awareness in the community about the issue of, of structural racism, of white privilege, mm -hmm. uh, to get people talking about it, uh, to uh, raise up the uh, organizations that are, are trying to do something about it, um, you know, and to create an opportunity for people to join in uh, to try to uh, make a difference. So, so as Rise was was going along, uh, Rise became aware of the fact that there was uh, some interest on the part of the Science and Museum Center to uh, bring to Rochester a traveling race exhibit called "Race Are We So Different?" Mm -hmm. And we thought, wow, this is a great opportunity to connect with that. Uh, because that's a great platform for community education. Uh, and so we partnered with the, with the uh, Rochester Museum and Science Center and approached the Community Foundation to get uh, funding to ensure that the exhibit would come to Rochester. Mm -hmm. So in the process of planning for that, the Community Foundation said, okay, we'll consider providing funding, but we don't want to just provide funding for something that's going to like, come and go. So right. what's going to be the what's going to be the framework or the process for ensuring uh, that the, uh, the message of the exhibit lives in the community once the exhibit is gone. Mm -hmm. And so we then brought some more people into, to, into the RISE family mm -hmm. and uh, decided that we needed to be even broader. And so we said we need a new name uh, and that became, and it took you know several meetings yeah. to come up with a name that everyone was comfortable with. Uh, and out came face and race and race and equity. 
uh, and Kate Bennett, uh, the president and CEO of the Science Center, and I uh, became the co-chairs. And so my role uh, as co-chair is, you know, to help convene meetings, uh, to try to help secure resources to keep the, keep the initiative going, okay. um, and to uh, you know be an advocate uh, for the goals of free uh, in my work and in my various community connections. So um, the summit this year has 12 breakout sessions. Right. There are no like keynote speakers as I'm aware of. Not really. There will be a plenary session at the beginning, but it's not going to be like any real speeches. Right. Uh, then there's a plenary at the end, uh, which is a call to action in terms of what we're going to do in the future. Right. But the heart of it uh, is the 12 breakout sessions you mentioned uh, that will allow people to dialogue about uh, various aspects of, of of structural racism and structural inequality. And has has this always been the model? For, this is the third annual. Has this is this the third annual the model model for these annual summits, or no, is it different? This is a new model. Okay. Uh, the first summit we had uh, two years ago was really just making the community aware of of free as an organization to try to just get people involved. Um, and there were some there were some breakout sessions on some of the typical major areas like education and healthcare, and criminal mm -hmm. justice, et cetera, um, just to get people talking. By the time we got to the second summit last year, yeah. we had actually engaged in a process uh, where we formed work groups around the various interest areas. Mm -hmm. Those work groups um, you know, studied their various areas, came up with some goals, mm -hmm. and then we had a process where the work groups went out and had focus groups uh, with different parts of the community about their goals. Mm -hmm. and, and by May of last year, we had a what we call a racial equity community agenda, mm -hmm. which was the, the name for the list of 20 goals that we came up with from the various areas. And so the second summit was really unveiling those goals uh, to the community and getting further feedback on next steps. And so this uh, summit is different in that it's free and all the other uh, major initiatives we're able to identify uh, that, in a sense, are trying to achieve some of the same objectives. Okay. So, so this is like a new, a new uh, model for this year. That's correct. And from everyone I've talked to, everyone seems really excited about <laughs> yeah. this model. It sounds like it's yeah. going to be a lot more talk and a lot less, you know, listening to people that right. maybe have knowledge about this right. stuff. A lot more talk, fewer yeah. speeches, right. uh, much, you know, broader engagement. Uh, and, and by uh, broadening the, um, the landscape and getting more people involved, I think we'll see more interconnections between mm -hmm. Um, you know some of the issues that we tend to sometimes deal with in isolation. Like the, the synergy might happen amongst the participants. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to just? Do you have the information about? I do. Yeah. Do you want to just like lay out what, when, where, what time? Yeah. So the event itself is going to be held on Saturday, September twenty-six, and it's going to be from eleven a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Wilson Foundation Academy, which is 200 uh, Genesee Street. Uh, I guess a long time ago, that would have been like um, Madison High School uh, in the past uh, generations. And people can register uh, by going on our website, which is faceracerock.org backslash summit. And that'll take you right to the registration page and if you just go to the regular website page without doing the backslash, then you have to look up on the top left and there's a link mm -hmm. or a little banner that says 215 Summit. So you can do it either by the general website or by doing the backslash after faceracerock.org and, and you'll get to the registration. And then you'll be able to choose to participate in a one of 12 breakout sessions. And uh, there is a, um, a sort of a desired limit to the number of people in each session. And so if you, at this point, 
uh, attempt to register and the session that you want to register for is filled, then you'll be asked to make a choice from one of the other remaining sessions on the list. Okay. Yes. Um, do you have all the sessions? Do yes, you I do. Do you them? I will. Yeah, please do. Uh, so the uh, first session, session number one, uh, is called Witness and Whiteness. Uh, that's going to be facilitated by Jean Carroll from the YWCA. Mm -hmm. um, there have been um, at least two opportunities for people to participate in a series of, of um, sessions on that issue of witness and whiteness, uh, which is about, uh, you know, how do white people participate, you know, from their whiteness mm -hmm. in efforts to eliminate the scourge of racism. Mm -hmm. uh, so that'll be very interesting. Uh, in fact, there's a, there's a series going on right now, the second series uh, on that, and I guess there'll be a subsequent series. I think in a series, I think it's about about eight sessions okay. uh, that people uh, go through, and there's like, you know, books and materials that, wow, yeah. that help prepare people to participate. Yeah. Then we have um, uh, a session on readdressing power imbalances through cultural humility. Um, and um, that's going to be facilitated by Christine Hocker, Kit Miller, Malik Thompson, um, and uh, the Institute for, the Gandhi Institute for um, Nonviolence. That is uh, more or less around, you know, respecting other cultures uh, and not being so uh, ethnocentric, so to speak, about your own culture. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then the next session is called Achieving the American Dream. How can we create a practical a program, a practical program of land and housing for all in Rochester? And uh, so we know, I think, we'll be talking about things like redlining. We'll be talking about uh, lending policies of our financial institutions. We'll be talking about uh, you know foreclosures um, and, and, and those kinds of things. Um, and then there is a session on a conversation on race and poverty. Uh, the facilitators for that would be uh, Steve DeRose, um, James Thompson, and Judy Toya. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be, you know, talking about the connection between race and poverty. Mm -hmm. And we know that, um, at least in our community, uh, being a highly segregated community, uh, that we have this issue called the concentration of poverty. Um, you know, where we have uh, many census tracts mm -hmm. uh, that are really off the charts in regard to the percentage of people in poverty. And it just happens to be that the majority of people in those particular um, census tracts are people of color. Do you um, think that that's just how it happens to be, or do you think that that's... Well, it's the way it's been engineered to be. Right. Um, yeah, that, I guess that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, like, it's, it's not yeah, it, it, naturally... It, 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 not, <laughs> no, it's not natural. In fact, <laughs> right. in fact, I was recently in a conversation, it was kind of funny. Um, someone said, well, um, the people really like being in their community. They don't want to move. They want their community to improve. Well, it's it's sort of like partly true, partly not true. Right. Is that there there were years that we built the suburbs and we you know restricted people's opportunity to access the suburbs. Therefore, you know you lock people into a certain geography, and certainly people that are locked in want their communities to improve, but. At the same time, people want choice. Right. You know, they want opportunity right. uh, that hasn't been available. And uh, so the, um, you know, the uh, issue of concentrated poverty uh, sort of creates a us and them type of set setup in our community. And so we have you know disinvestment from the business side. You know, you can't find a food store. Um, all those kind of things yeah. uh, because. We've created this uh, paradigm, uh, and we've lived by the paradigm that uh, some people deserve better than others, right. uh, and therefore we can ignore or or skip over things by saying that you know it's is their choice or it's their fault. Uh, it reminds me also of a conversation I had with a, another person. Uh, we were talking about the disparity in home ownership. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, and that was a gentleman that was that was a part of this discussion, and um, he just raised the question of whether or not um, people of color uh, have the same value of home ownership that that maybe whites have, and maybe that's why we have a difference. 
you know, and it was an innocent question. Yeah. But obviously, it doesn't explain why we have the difference. Yeah. We have the difference because of discriminatory housing policies, right. redlining, um, uh, unfair lending. Uh, because uh, you know, example from from the 1930s up until the early 1960s, uh, the Federal Housing Administration uh, put 120 billion dollars into mortgage subsidies, and it just happens that less than two percent of those uh, mortgages uh, went to people of color. You know, it's really, I, I read um, this guy named James Lowen. He wrote a book called Sundown Towns, okay. and it was looking at like. In, in like from like you know the 1930s to like the 1980s, he was looking at like de facto segregation of housing in the South, um, as we know with Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. But then he was also very specifically focused on the North at the same time, mm -hmm. and how you did, maybe didn't have legal Jim Crow, but you had mm -hmm. de facto Jim Crow or de facto segregation. Mm -hmm. And and I think in that book he actually mentions that the FHA had policies where they explicitly wrote you cannot give loans to black people. Well, the, what, the, what, they, like what, know, what, what they had um, was, well, it, it, it ends up being uh, redlining, but yeah. they, they had a federal housing policy uh, that, that rated geographic areas within over 250 American cities mm -hmm. as, you know, either like red, yellow, green. Uh, and so for the red areas, uh, they were not supporting mortgages for those areas. And those areas, okay. those areas happened to be areas where people of color predominated. Uh, and the green areas were areas where whites yeah. predominated. Yeah. And so the mortgage lenders uh, were going to those areas that were favored by the Federal Housing Administration. And not the, the red areas. That's right, not the red yeah. areas. So yeah. this wasn't even like necessarily a locally produced situation, it was also federally produced. That's right, yeah. that's right. In fact, there were maps, there were actual maps uh, that color-coded these communities. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, so like, if you looked at the map of Chicago uh, from 1940, uh, thereabouts, you'll see that, like, um, the areas near the lake, mm -hmm. at that time, uh, they were the reddish, um, yellowish type areas. Now, that's not the case today. No, certainly not. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but at that point not. in time, that's the way it was. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so so like the, the the segregation register is not just tied to like local ordinances or local actions, but right. definitely the federal government had a hand in like maintaining that system of yeah. yeah. And in fact, okay, so we had the Fair, Fair Housing Act of 1968, which was really it was leftover work from the Civil Rights Act of 1964, mm -hmm. uh, and so that was supposed to you know open up opportunities for folks. Uh, what we found is over the years, uh, the federal government has very, been very um, reluctant to vigorously enforce the provisions of the Fair Housing Act, mm -hmm. and therefore you have communities getting community development block grant funds, other federal dollars, and continuing to to reinforce segregated patterns. Okay. It was only in the month of June that the Supreme Court ruled on a housing issue that allowed the Obama administration to issue new rules that now require uh, those communities receiving those funds to aggressively advance the goals of fair housing. So that's a new tool. Uh, as of June 2015. As of June 2015 is when the Supreme Court ruled. The Obama administration just issued the new rules. Uh, and so that means it gives more power to advocacy organizations uh, to question a unit of government is to how are you aggressively, you know, moving toward yeah. uh, use of fair housing with these dollars? Well, thank you for that aside. Please go yeah. back to the <laughs> <You're on my laughs> list. Yeah. No, it's, it's really fascinating. So, right. yeah, it's right. heart-rending heart stuff. So, uh, the next area we have um, is a workshop or breakout on school to prison pipeline. And that's going to be facilitated by Valerie uh, Caldwell, Anna Cassidy, Pat Maddox. Iman Scanlon and Sally Williams, and the school and prison pipeline, you know, you know, sort of connects to this current issue that we're dealing with in terms of revising the school code, and um, and you know, children um, not being um, dealt with through restorative practices and other means, is you know, putting them out of school, um, and and them not having any skills to get a job, ending up in a prison system, and so. 
hopefully this workshop will bring forth ideas about you know how do we um, you know use different methods of discipline that doesn't re re result in expulsion uh, doesn't result result in things that should be handled uh, within the school setting becoming issues within the criminal justice setting. Um, you know, Monroe County, unfortunately, uh, has um, um, many different, uh, you know, says bad marks in, in, in different areas. And one of the bad marks is is that we, um, uh, one of the leading uh, counties in the state that are putting juveniles into the juvenile mm. justice system. Uh, in fact, the, the, the county, um, I think it was the, um, Maybe it was the Office of Probation um, I mentioned about two or three years ago, you know, doing some kind of study mm -hmm. to determine why it is that, that we are disproportionately putting young people into the now justice system. Um, then there's going to be a breakout on the Unite Rochester mm -hmm. uh, campaign, which is the sort of a parallel activity by the Democratic Chronicle magazine to a newspaper to um, from time to time highlight things that are going on in the community that have to do with the issues of race and, and inequality um, and you know they use a little symbol in the newspaper to yeah, yeah. to identify when those kind of stories are are going to be um, be aired then there's going to be a workout on police and community relations uh, how to build trust mm -hmm. and um, we know that's that's real important, um, but all the different things going on around the country, um, as well as in our community, um, and so I think the uh, mayor's effort to uh, reorganize the uh, police um, structure mm -hmm. uh, and to uh, get more more people walking uh, and interacting with people in the communities is uh, related to that. Uh, then we have. Um, judicial um, and community relations and so there will be a series of, of judges that will be uh, contributing uh, their ideas in that particular area and so uh, that has to do with uh, when judges are confronted with difficult situations uh, you know what resources do they have at their disposal uh, to sort of connect people to things they need um, it has to do with um, whether or not uh, the caseloads uh, that, for instance, public defenders have, whether the caseload is, is manageable. Um, we know that most of the, it, regardless of a race, most of the, of the uh, cases are going to courts of plea bargain. Right. Because it's a matter of trying to, to, to move the docket, move the docket. And um, so, you know, it's questions about uh, racial equity in terms of that agenda. Uh, then we have, um, a breakout on raise the age in comprehensive reform. So raise the age has to do with whether we should be sending um, teenagers to prison. Okay. Um, and and so we don't believe that should be the case. Um, we believe that um, you know putting you know children you know into adult environments uh, is not particularly healthy, positive, um, and leads to a lot of bad outcomes. And so we'll be talking about that. Um, then we'll be talking about in a, another workshop or breakout is race and justice partnerships. And, and Mike Bleak, uh, who is the um, co-chair of Freeze um, Justice Workgroup, uh, and uh, Cynthia Harriet Sullivan, a former um, uh, policeman mm -hmm. uh, in Rochester and a, an active member in the Unite Rochester effort, along with some uh, faith leaders, will be addressing um, race and justice issues. Um, and it, that'll probably overlap with some of the other uh, workshop areas. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like, from what you've read so far, it sounds like a lot of these are very interconnected. Like yes. They all have, they're all links in a, in a, a chain that's really weighting down this whole community. Yeah. Ways. Yeah. And and so that it, it, it's, it makes the point that there's there are many points of intervention, yeah. um, and and we need to be addressing all these issues at the same time. Same time, yeah. Uh, then there's the um, 
breakout that deals with um, developing authentic alternatives um, from the street to jobs. Uh, because we know that that uh, economic uh, deprivation is a, a, an issue. We know that in many of our um, communities, the unemployment rate is many multiples of the quote official right. unemployment rate. And then um, if you're like an ex-offender, it's even oh, higher, right? It's, it's, it's even worse. Yeah. So we have, you know, fortunately in the city of Rochester, we passed, you know, the band box legislation. We did, yeah. But just it's only in the city, right. you know, and um, and and even it, and when you pass a piece of legislation like that, it doesn't mean that it automatically has an effect, <laughs> right. you know. Okay. And because it's got to be enforced. It's got to be enforced. Yeah. Um, it's got to be enforced, and um, and then when people find ways to circumvent it, mm -hmm. you have to come and and come up with an amendment or another statute right. on back of the first statute to try to, to make the change a reality. Yeah. And um, I haven't said anything about, except I did say some about public education, but the next one, um, and the, the 12th of our, our work groups, our breakouts, is racism um, in public education. Mm -hmm. um, and so there uh, was some training going on earlier this week uh, with some uh, people from the school district on that, on that particular topic. Uh, we know that there's culturally um, a uh, situation that needs to be bridged within the school district where you have, you know, 90% um, uh, children of color, mm -hmm. where you have 75% uh, instructors who are not people of color, um, and and those those connections um, need to be uh, reinforced, improved, uh, because it makes a difference in terms of role modeling makes different in terms of expectations, uh, takes, makes different in terms of parent involvement, um, and so that's um, a real critical area to be addressed. And that, that's definitely different than like the school to prison pipeline, which is talking about like suspensions and police Correct. involvement in conflicts in the school grounds. Or exactly. Like yeah. Exactly. This, this is, so just think of this as, think of this, of this one, uh, think of curriculum, mm -hmm. um, you know, think of you know, cultural diversity, cultural sensitivity. Yeah. Um, um, think of of the uh, efforts on the part of the school district to actually attract um, uh, different people to the workforce than mm -hmm. we currently have. So you seem to have a familiarity with almost all of those, yes. if not all of them. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is there any one or two that you really are excited to go to or see or like be a part well, of? Well, I'm, I'm going, I'm, my, my first preference is, and I made my choice and it was accepted. Uh, <laughs> you, you didn't get, I didn't get sorry, sorry, James, I got right. you know, I didn't get kicked out. <laughs> um, it's going to be um, judicial and community relations, okay. um, and, and, and part of my interest there is that uh, I'm, I'm the co-chair of the judicial work group for the Rochester Monroe Anti-Poverty Initiative. Okay. So it connects to something else that I'm doing. Right. Um, um, if I were able to go to more than one, uh, <laughs> I certainly would uh, want to go to the one on education. Yeah. Um, the, the one you were just addressing the last that one. The last yeah. one. Uh, because um, that's where things begin and end for a lot of our uh, children in our community because yeah. um, we, we, we see the poor results and and there may be issues with the test um, you know but you know you're comparing you know, our students to other students um, and uh, our students seem to be way 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 behind mm -hmm. um, and so one measure of progress is, is really getting these scores improved. Um, and we seem to just be stuck. Yeah. Um, you know, we've been talking about um, graduation rates, you know, around somewhere in the 40s or around 50%. We've been talking about that for like 10 years. Yeah. Um, and so we don't seem to be getting the movement which says that we're not necessarily doing the right things. So we're looking for it. Uh, I guess a deeper dive into the problem right. to figure out where are some of the um, 
points of intervention to actually change change the needle. Yeah. Because we have we have you know kids that aren't graduating. We have of those that are graduating, according to some assessments, only you know five or ten percent of those are quote college ready. Um, and so I can uh, deal with that or relate to that in some way because uh, for the last uh, 16 years, mm -hmm. I've been an adjunct uh, professor at Monroe Community College. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I teach an evening class, so I don't have a class full of young people. I have a mixture, but I have a significant number of young people in those classes that are, are just out of high school or just going to college for the first time, mm -hmm. not too uh, long from high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I can you know, directly see uh, the, the quote, lack of preparation mm -hmm. that's desired for doing college work right. in regard to reading and writing. Just those basics. It's very clear to you. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. very clear. Yeah. It's very clear. Um, so, so I don't just teach the subject. I also teach those other areas, yeah. Because if they don't, if they don't like, if they don't improve their skills in those other areas, then they won't be able to to move up and master, you know, other yeah. types of college work um, that they need to be able to do. So I want to switch gears a little bit. But who, this conference? Who would you say the audience is? Who are you gearing this toward? We're gearing the audience uh, to. The people who need, I would say, the, the information we have to give out the most. Um, you know, we we have the choir, mm -hmm. um, and and we want the choir to participate. Yeah. But we know that if we just keep preaching to the choir, that that alone is not sufficient. Right. Uh, so we you know went to this new format with this diversity of of uh, areas of intervention, so that. Perhaps people who uh, may not connect to the general ethos of what we're talking about may say, "Well, yeah, I am interested in housing, or I am interested in criminal justice, or I am interested in education." Um, so there's like a little point of engagement for them that they can come to. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So we're, we're definitely trying to do a lot of uh, of uh, media, a lot of outreach yeah. uh, to uh, get more people into the discussion because we believe that. Um, well, you you have you have omission and commission. Uh, commission would be what I would characterize as folks who, who who know better, who just don't do better, and then you have those who who, who need to know better that don't know better. Yeah. So, um, do you, do you have any idea at this point how many people have registered? So far, we have surpassed 150 registrations so far as of. Last night. That's awesome. That's yeah, great. so we're expecting we're expecting about three hundred people. That's great. Um, and we've we've extended the online registration. It was originally going to end September twenty first, and we're going to extend that for a couple of days. Cool. Okay. Now people can also um, if they wait to the very last minute and they can't register online because they will shut down yeah. uh, by the twenty third. Uh, there's a number here they could call. Um, 325-5116, extension 1732. 325-5116, extension 1732, if they actually missed the online registration. And um, I get so the, thank you for describing all those breakout sessions, because I think that that shows the, the breadth and the depth, of, really, of what you guys, free, is hoping to get out of this summit. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my question is, I don't know, it's just very obvious maybe, but, but what is it, why should people care? Why should people come to this? Well, I think people should come to this because there's a certain reality uh, that should not be denied or ignored, and that's the reality of a changing America. Mm -hmm. um, uh, changing America from a, a demographic standpoint um, and in order for us to remain you know competitive we want to be competitive um, with other countries um, and if we are not 
developing our human capital, which we're not. Mm -hmm. um, then we're going to have a lot of people who are dependent, who aren't able to, productive, to productively participate in our society. Mm -hmm. uh, and the more that we, in a sense, grow that population that is being marginalized or or uh, undervalued, um, then the more perilous our ability to be a leader in the world is going to be. Mm -hmm. So just from the standpoint of selfishness and 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 and, 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 and business competitiveness, mm -hmm. um, is that we have to get more people off the bench, onto the playing field, and we need to eliminate the barriers uh, that's causing us not to take advantage of, you know, people who have tremendous talent and ability, uh, but they're not able to develop it or show it uh, because we are operating in a antiquated paradigm mm -hmm. of racism. So self-preservation at the very least. Oh yeah. I mean, come out for that. Oh yeah. Yeah, and then just, I mean, I always think about that concept thriving or, you know, uh, surviving or thriving, you know, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. what kind of Rochester do I want to live in? I mean, I want to live in a Rochester where everyone is thriving, where we're all doing really well. And I, I, I moved, I moved away, I grew up in Brighton, I moved away, I came back in 2006 mm -hmm. after getting a college degree and, mm -hmm. and uh, started doing a lot of activism, video work, journalism, um, and it just struck me the disparity between the two and how mm -hmm. growing up none of that was ever taught to me i never understood any of mm -hmm. that and mm -hmm. you just had your upbringing in the suburbs and that was it and there was right. no issue and right. and then to think about like how all of this is so interconnected and the the 12 sessions are just a testament of of that i mean that that's incredible you know mm -hmm. just like how there, like you said there's so many points of engagement or, or uh interdiction with with these issues mm -hmm. um is there anything that you wanted to share that I haven't asked you about today or any last comments you wanted to make? Well, I would like to, to say that um, the education aspect of what we're trying to do is critically important um, uh, because we do have that wall of, of resistance or wall of ignorance mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, trying to describe or explain the current situation as uh, being something that is caused by people who are the victims of structural inequality and structural racism. Uh, and so that, that keeps them stuck in a point of inaction and blame, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that's, that's one of the main things we're trying to break through is to get people to widen their perspective and lens on analyzing the problems we have um, so we can begin to make some of the policy changes, mm -hmm. some of the structural changes, some of the institutional changes that we need to make um, to you know, break down the, the, the fear uh, that people have about this change that's going on. Uh, because it's gonna keep going on. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's more healthy for everyone to adapt to the change than to you know, try to keep denying the change. Push back against it, yeah. Right. I mean, you, what you just said, is, I mean, speaks to me like a, a stereotypes, you know, like, oh, well, you're the reason that there's a problem because you aren't working hard enough, or you mm -hmm. can't find a job, or mm -hmm. you're not educated enough, or mm -hmm. you have been to jail or prison, you know, mm -hmm. you're the problem. Mm -hmm. Instead of looking at the systems that are in place that create those problems, and then pundits or media use easy outs to blame people rather than actually figure out ways to like break down the systems that are causing yeah. things in the first place. Yeah, the reality of our, I guess, our outcomes uh, are a combination of, of environmental structures mm -hmm. and influences and, and individual effort. So we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't deny um, individual effort right. as, no, no, no. As, 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 as being a part of what needs to happen in some cases. Sure. Uh, but we reject, you know, any, any notion that that's the only thing that matters. Yeah, right, right. You know, we reject the notion of of a level playing field. It is it is it is a nice little thing to say, but it's not true. Um, and um, so we have to uh, re-educate um, people to the realities of the world we live in. James Norman, thank you so much for spending.
spending time with today and, and Thank you. this is wonderful. Thank you.